just one day I got a fever and I tried to get out of bed and fell on the floor. And the doctor said, get her to Children's Hospital in Omaha, she has polio. Most two-year-olds don't remember their illnesses, but this was so powerful and it, I literally was just flattened for maybe a week where I couldn't move at all. Post polio syndrome is not due to the polio virus. It's a delayed after effect of damage done to the nerves. Hi, I'm Scott Wheeler. I'd like to talk with you about an old subject in a new light, polio. It's a disease that has different meanings for different people. If you were around in the 1940s, 50s, or 60s, it has a fearful meaning of terrifying worldwide epidemics. It conjures up images of iron lungs, crutches, leg braces, and quarantine. But if you were born in the 1960s, you might associate the disease with an injection or a few drops of vaccine on a sugar cube. But if you were born in the last 25 years or so, you might wonder about this mysterious ailment and what all the fuss is about. Many parents today are refusing to vaccinate their children against this once dreaded scourge they consider the disease to have been eradicated from the world. Would it surprise you to know that according to the Polio Independent Monitoring Board, there were 223 new cases of polio reported globally in 2012, and in 2013, active wild polio virus has been found in sewage in Egypt? What exactly is polio, and what does it do when you contract the illness? Well, I was two years old, and um, as a two-year-old, you don't remember much, but what I remembered a lot about this situation, because all of a sudden I had this <clears throat> cold or flu that was worse than I had ever experienced. So when you think about that, most two-year-olds don't remember their illnesses, but this was so powerful and it, I literally was just flattened for maybe a week where I couldn't move at all. And it was very frustrating and very, um, I was very afraid. And once it subsided, then I couldn't walk anymore. I used to run all over the place. And I got very, very frustrated because I couldn't lift myself off and start running around again. And so I rapidly developed this technique for walking on all fours, <laughs> like a monkey. So, uh, and my mother was great, you know, she, she didn't know what to do, so she just was happy that I was moving around again. But that, that's what I remember about it. And then there were steps after that, but um, it, it was pretty frightening, you know, originally. Well, I was um, about four and a half. It was early 1950. And um, I guess this, my mother is related to me and her memory wasn't as good as it should have been, but um, I had a real runny nose and a sore throat and a high fever. And I'd been to the doctor a few times and the doctor didn't know what was wrong with me. And this time my dad took me to the doctor and they called my name and I got up and collapsed. And the doctor said, get her to Children's Hospital in Omaha, she has polio. So I was completely paralyzed from the neck down for about six weeks and in the hospital, I guess a good six months. And I remember I was quarantined, I couldn't see my parents for like six those six weeks I can remember my mom looking through the window in the door at me and she said I would <laughs> I would look at her like I hate you what do you put me here for when a child that young to me it seemed awful cruel now that I think about it. for six weeks without your parents in a strange place yeah just one day I got a fever and I tried to get out of bed and fell on the floor and back in those days, Dr. McGregor, who was our doctor, made house calls. And in those, back when I was 16, there were a lot of people that had polio. And they were in iron lungs and in the hospital. 
And since all I had was a low-grade fever and my mother had been a nurse, uh, Dr. McGregor said, you can stay home, I'll come every day and monitor you. And then there was a discussion of should I have a spinal tap to make sure it really was polio. And we decided, why bother? You know, it wasn't going to change anything. Uh, and so for about two months, uh, July and August, when I was 16, I was in bed. And by the time September rolled around, uh, the fever had gone. And uh, so I spent my senior year in high school. Uh, and then that following summer, I had uh, water skis and a boat and tried that out. That didn't work. My legs wouldn't take that. And then I went off to college in New Hampshire and bought head skis and the whole outfit and never made it down the first hill, let alone mountain. Up until recently, we thought that pertussis, or whooping cough, was no longer a threat. More and more, however, we're hearing of whooping cough turning up in schools around the country, as well as in formerly vaccinated adults. Is it so far-fetched that polio, which still infects mostly infants and children in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Nigeria, could suddenly appear once again in the United States? In the last decade, there has been a marked decline in vaccination rates in the United States. There's been a lot of media attention given to certain ideas and people who don't necessarily follow the scientific process and the scientific literature. And a lot of myths have been propagated uh, regarding vaccines. And this has caused people to be very hesitant. We used to be very afraid of the diseases. Now the diseases are not an issue anymore because we've done such a great job in public health of vaccinating kids and we don't see the diseases as much. So people have displaced that fear to vaccines now. And there is a lot of concern that um, the pharma pharmacological um, companies are in cahoots with government, who's in cahoots with the doctors. So this large conspiracy of people are supposedly um, doing things to our children that we may not want them to do. We've recently had um, a man who came from India come into Colorado who brought measles with him, did not know that he had it, went to a dermatologist's office for this rash that he was having, and um, they discovered it was measles, but by then he'd already infected another person who was there unknowingly um, breathing the same air in the same room and wasn't immune. So those things happen. Most of us uh, are not aware of polio. I bet young kids wouldn't even have an idea what it is because we don't see that anymore. We don't see that in our country. And uh, people who were raised in the era of polio disease being prevalent, um, there was a huge fear. Um, you didn't have to try to convince them once there was a vaccine available to have their kids vaccinated. They knew what could happen and they were afraid of having that happen to their children. Public health has done an excellent job with prevention. Prevention doesn't get the, the media attention, it's not sensational, it's kind of one of those things that just lays under the surface. We've done such a good job, but that is a very, very thin layer of protection because it wouldn't take a lot to have diseases come back with a vengeance if we don't vaccinate our children. Polio, like flu, is an extremely contagious disease, but caused by polioviruses. Earlier symptoms include fever, sore throat, vomiting or diarrhea, muscle pain and stiffness, and sometimes meningitis. People can contract mild, moderate, or severe cases of both flu and polio. Both produce fatalities. 
Both diseases can now be prevented by vaccination, but once contracted, neither has a specific cure. The viruses differ markedly in that polio primarily targets infants and children. Polio can also attack the nervous system and has the unique ability to paralyze its victims temporarily or permanently. In addition, polio packs a one-two punch in that about 25% of those who recover from the acute disease often experience debilitating muscle pain and weakness, fatigue, swallowing and breathing difficulties 10 to 25 or even 50 or 60 years after the original illness. This progressive weakness is called post-polio syndrome. We are now discovering that former polio patients with post-polio problems are at risk from another direction. Since medical education no longer prepares doctors or nurses to recognize either active polio infection or post-polio problems, many doctors are not aware in what ways the body has been weakened by the polio virus. Their efforts to help without special information can be dangerous and even deadly to someone with post-polio syndrome. It really did not come to my attention until I became aware of the Polio Plus program through Rotary International. And being a Rotarian, I took interest in the subject and pursued looking into it. And that's really when I became aware of post-polio syndrome was about 10 years ago or so through Rotary Club. I suspect that I have seen cases of it and did not know it because it is similar to other neurological diseases that we do study in medical school and during our residency and have much more attention in the medical literature than post-polio syndrome. Diseases like multiple sclerosis and ALS, which is Lou Gehrig's disease, and fibromyalgia and other syndromes in which the patient becomes quite weak has frequently pain, perhaps some swallowing difficulty, breathing difficulty, and we usually do not think of post-polio syndrome. And it's interesting to note that many patients who had polio as a child do not tell people about that, including their physician. And so if patients who had polio don't bring it to the attention of their doctor, the doctor frequently will not even think of polio or post-polio syndrome as a possible diagnosis. I looked at a textbook of neurology which the neurologist in our clinic uses. I found two sentences in the entire textbook on post-polio syndrome. And in fact, I actually spoke with the neurologist himself who is a recent graduate of his neurology training and he feels he has seen one case of post-polio syndrome. I think awareness of post-polio syndrome is lacking tremendously in this country. And we as physicians need to do a better job of being aware of it and I think the general public needs to be aware that in patients who have survived polio that on average approximately 30 to 50 percent of them will develop post polio syndrome approximately 25 to 35 years later and that's why we are now seeing the post polio syndrome uh, since the vaccination came out in the mid 50s the incidence of polio has dropped up off tremendously in this country, the United States. In fact, there has not been a case since 1979 in the United States. But post-polio syndrome now is what we as physicians and the general public needs to be aware of is starting to show up and we need to include it in our differential diagnosis when patients come in with weakness and fatigue and pain syndromes, they need to tell us that they did have polio when they were a child because that's important information. The long-lasting effects of polio are not just statistics or numbers. They affect an estimated half a million people in the U.S. daily. I would just 
I would just get so tired and I had, as the day went on, I had more muscle pain. But the fatigue is what always has bothered me the most, just the chronic fatigue. In fact, I retired younger because my husband said, you're not gonna work anymore. You, he's, you know, I just come home dragging. Had a lot of responsibility. So I just, just was fatigued so much. I like to travel, but it's very tiring. Mm -hmm. In fact, some two couples asked us to go on a cruise with them in January, and I said I just I didn't think I could do it. You know, just that far away, and so uh, I didn't. So I, I probably I would travel more, mm -hmm. and I like to shop. I would probably <laughs> shop more. <laughs> you know, I was uh, I was in a job sitting at work when I was 45, and all of a sudden uh, I started getting some really terrible back aches that were scrunching. My back was really, not just my back is fatigued, but my back is really hurting. And then I realized that a lot of things had been happening all along, like maybe a little bit less stamina when I used to be able to work from six in the morning till six at night on my home projects. Maybe I had a little less stamina to do those. Uh, and so I was frustrated. I didn't know what was going on, but that was... There was a, a point at which something changed in a big enough way that I was able to jump out of the, the pan and say, hey, I'm a boiled frog. <laughs> What's the deal? You know, I've got some hot water around me, you know. <laughs> and so that's what happens. You, you're kind of like the boiled frog in denial of anything, pushing through. And then you find out that something isn't the same. So that's when I started checking into doctors. There were a couple of specialists when I realized that. And there was one, that I went to New York. My parents are from the East and they knew of this guy that was a world expert. And so I went in there and he said, yeah, he took some measurements. You have post polio. Mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't have any particular diagnosis like of what I should be doing, but Maybe I shouldn't carry that big backpack I was bringing along. Um, and uh, he, he basically um, didn't amount to much because he didn't add any goods. So I was thinking to myself, could I have my $300 back, please? <laughs> In retrospect, I have a, a bout of a problem even earlier, I think. Uh, when I was in California, I was kayaking in the ocean and I got slammed by a wave and it smacked my back and uh, I came back to Fort Collins and I, I couldn't hardly walk. Something had happened. So I went to this chiropractor and she straightened me out but she also realized that I needed a, a quarter inch lift in my shoe. And if I did that quarter inch to three eighths in my right shoe that would balance my back perfectly. And from that point on that I, I went to her for about 12 years and what really happened was that was the pivotal thing to, to make me a little more balanced, mm -hmm. more straight, and then it really improved things a lot. The first time, and I really panicked because we had taken a really long walk, and you know, like, I figured we were going to get to Oklahoma by the time I got finished, and walking back, I thought, I'm not going to make it. And I didn't want to say anything to Haley, you know, she was just that high. I made it, got home and, you know, crawled into my chair and took a couple of aspirin and said, okay, I've got to rethink my life now. I can't do this anymore. And since then, it's gotten progressively um, worse. You know, uh, I can stand up for maybe three minutes as long as I'm not walking. And I can walk on my crutches, but if I overdo it, I pay for it at night. If I'm going to do something really active today, tomorrow I'm not going to put anything on my calendar. You know, I, I try to take a day off uh, between doing things. And I'm not talking about really big things. I'm talking about like going a big shopping or, you know, something like that. You know, going to Walmart and, and lugging cat litter, uh, that kind of thing. Or here, you know, as you see, I've got a lot of plants. And I take care of them all and get lug them in and out in my wheelchair. But even 
doing stuff in my wheelchair, that's, it's tiring. Across the nation, there are small groups of people who get together once a month or so to talk about their thoughts, experiences, and to support each other in their commonality. These post-polio support groups give their members an outlet with others who can relate to what each member is going through. The biggest thing is you realize that you're not on this journey by yourself. Uh, even if you don't get any suggestions that would work for you, you realize that you're just not that special. And, and that is important because otherwise you're feeling alone about recovery or dealing with the issues. And then on top of that, you get good friendships mm -hmm. and you get uh, uh, good advice at times, things to look into, and you can laugh a bit about it. And I think that can be therapeutic right there. So all around, it's been very helpful. Mm -hmm. Uh, the people who ran it before me um, were awesome, at including everyone, and I kind of inherited the, the, the role, but the it's been very, very helpful to me, and I encourage people to not do it by themselves, uh, if they can find a good group, or start a good group of their own. Um, part of my mantra in all this is, you know, what I always tell Frances, my wife, is, Really, it's about just get over yourself, you know. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's it, it sounds a little harsh, but the reality is that when you start focusing outside of yourself, mm -hmm. I think you can start helping other people or just doing better yourself. But if you draw inward and you start moping around, that's when you can spiral downhill. Mm -hmm. And I've seen people who have gotten as old as in their mid to late 90s in our group and still having a chipper attitude. And I can tell you that attitude is the number one thing. Attitude is everything for, for dealing with this because you can come up with all kinds of strategies. You know, your, your mind is, your health, is, is with you when you have polio. Unlike some mental disorders, you know, your mind is your ally in figuring things out that you need to change or do. Um, so, you know, the polio group helped a lot in mm -hmm. that. Um, changing that mindset and realizing that you were not by yourself. Even though the United States has not seen an active case of polio in many years, and despite worldwide efforts to eradicate it, the polio virus has not yet disappeared. Polio still exists in countries like Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Nigeria, lurking in places unknown to its potential victims. Countries in which wild polio exists are especially difficult to work in with even the most diligent eradication efforts. Until we go at least a decade without detecting the virus or seeing any active cases globally, we must maximize precautions. And to that end, all countries in the world, including the United States, must keep vaccination levels high, especially for children, the population most vulnerable to polio infection. Medical education needs to teach how to recognize, diagnose, and treat acute polio infection. Medical professionals must also recognize post-polio syndrome and be prepared to deal with, appropriately, the problems it causes. Don't take your health for granted. I'm Scott Wheeler, urging you to be well and keep Americans healthy.